Lift your hands and begin to worship the Lord right now with your own voice, in your own words. Come on, you don't need somebody else to tell you what words to say. Just give him your love. Tell him that you love him. Lord, we love you. We magnify you. We glorify you in this place because you are worthy of all of our love and all of our praise. You're worthy, Jesus. You're worthy, Jesus, King of kings, Lord of lords, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the great I am, the one who was and is and is to come. We worship you. We worship you. We worship you. We worship you. Lord, we stand here tonight in this land where you walked the earth. Lord, in this place where you died and where you gave your life for the nations of the world. And Lord, we've gathered back in this place from the four corners of the earth. And we lift up that name, the name above every name, the name at which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, the name of Jesus Christ to the glory of God the Father. We worship and we praise and we magnify that name in this place. Sing this with me. Give me a, a G. Come on, let's just sing one more song. Is that okay? Sing holy, holy are you Lord God oh my worthy who worthy is the Lamb that's it lift it up worthy is the Lamb you are something. This might be a little out of the norm for some of you because I know we come from all different backgrounds. I'm a fifth generation preacher's kid from a Pentecostal church. And you know, Pentecostals do some funny things. There's one thing that we used to do. I remember when we were kids, Eddie, I bet you remember this back in the old days, we used to do this thing called singing in the spirit. And, and, and the, what it was, for those of you that don't know, it was just a moment where spontaneously everyone would just begin to sing out of their heart. It was an overflow of love. Those that pr have a prayer language, they would begin to sing in that prayer language. Those that don't, they would just begin to sing the name of Jesus. They begin to tell him that they love him. And it was this beautiful waterfall of worship. And I wonder if we could just try that. Let's sing that chorus again. And then when we get to the end, I just want you to begin to worship him from your heart, okay? Just let it flow out of your innermost being. Jesus said out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Some of you are waiting for a, for a thunderbolt to come out of heaven, but Jesus didn't say out of the clear blue sky will flow rivers. He said out of your innermost being. You see, it comes from in here. The Holy Spirit lives in here and is going to flow out of there tonight. Now, I'll tell you what, you tell you what, I have a sermon prepared and it's a good one even if I'm the only one that thinks so. 
And I was asked tonight to preach on revival, on personal revival. But you see, I know something about revival because I, I, I used to live in revival. And I can tell you something. It's a lot better to experience it than to hear about it. And I, I feel the, the atmosphere is like electricity in here. And if we would just step into it, we can begin this week swimming in that river of the Holy Spirit. Can we do that? Come on, let's sing it. Holy. Sing holy. Every voice. Come on, Eddie, help me. Holy are you, Lord God. Just release it out of your innermost being. Oh, come on. Let it flow, let it flow, let it flow, let it flow. Let him hear you. Let him hear your hearts. It's a beautiful sound. Let him my, my, my. Step in. Your word is a lamp unto 
my feet Jesus I love you I love you sing it again your name is like your spirits like water to my soul your Jesus, I love you. I love you. Jesus, I love you. Oh, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Come on, tell him. I love you. Let it rise, let it rise. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, we love you, we love you. Come on. Jesus, I love you. Come on. Yeah, yeah, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Come on. I love you. Jesus. Jesus, I love you. I love you. And Lord, we say right here at the beginning of this week, at the beginning of the march, at the beginning of all of our preaching and singing and dancing, Lord, we say this is about one thing. It's about you. We're here because we love you. And Lord, if you don't show up and if you don't touch us and if we don't encounter you, then it's all for nothing. And so we say, Lord, have your way. Have your way tonight. Have your way tomorrow. Lord, let a mighty wave of revival begin here in this room that will spread across Jerusalem and all over Israel in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen. Come on, put your hands together for Jesus. Praise the Lord. Eddie, I love you, man. I tell you what, you guys have potential. Awesome. Come on, can we put our hands together for Eddie and the whole team and for all the dancers and worshipers that were here tonight? We love you guys. You're amazing. You're amazing. Come on, before you're seated, just turn around and give somebody a hug and tell them you've come to the right place. What a joy, what a joy. I'm good, I'm good for now. At the end though, at the end. Yeah, thanks man. Praise the Lord. Are you happy tonight? Are you happy to be in Jerusalem? The city of the great king. How many of you, this trip is your very first time in Jerusalem? Let me see your hands. Wow, what, what a joy. What a joy to be here. How many of you have been in Jerusalem several times before and you're, you're a veteran? 
All right. I tell you what, I had lunch with Pastor Yopes and Charlotte Bittner this uh, afternoon, and we were just talking about the amazing thing that's happening here. I don't think that most of us even realize the extent to which this is ordained by the Holy Spirit. Two years ago, when I spoke to Pastor Jobst in Germany, and he invited me to come here, I agreed, and none of us knew at that time that this very weekend was going to be the weekend that the embassy moved from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. I said to him, did, did you know that this was going to happen? He said, no, we had, we had no idea. And not only, not only did they plan it on the right weekend, but you see, if they had planned the march for tomorrow, then it couldn't have happened because of all the festivities going on tomorrow. They planned it on Tuesday, right, is the march. And so it's perfect. The timing is so perfect. And I said, man, you were right on track with that. And so, come on, can we just put our hands together for Pastor Yopes and Charlotte Bittner? And also for Pastor Andre and Bojena and the whole team that's helped put this march together. Come on, let's put our hands together for the March All Life team. We appreciate you guys. Also, we are honored by the presence tonight of MK Robert Ilatov, who's here from the Knesset. Thank you for being here. We honor you. Let's just put our hands together for him as well. And uh, my, my good friends Michael and Vanessa Mastretta are here today as well from Firm. We love you guys, we love the, the ministry that you represent, and we honor you in the Lord. You know, it's amazing when I see Heidi Baker sitting in a meeting like this. Because you know, most people of her stature, they, they fly in, they preach, and they leave before anybody can touch them or talk to them. And Heidi, comes and she sits and she receives and it just touches my heart, Heidi. I love you. I love you. We were, we were just together in Toronto a, a few days ago and uh, we had a, a little challenge there and I, I asked her at the very last minute if she would switch her preaching session to later in the day and it meant that she would have to miss the flight that she was supposed to be on and the next day she was supposed to speak at 10 o'clock in the morning in Washington. And so she changed her plans to accommodate us. She, she had to get up at some ungodly hour to go to the airport. And um, it just touches my heart to see a woman that's so precious, such a humble, godly woman. And uh, we, we love you, Heidi, and we honor you. I know I'm embarrassing you, but you have to endure it. And then after the meeting, you know, the, the meeting that she, she preached there, it ended in this spontaneous worship, and it went on. She, she actually got off the platform, and the worship went on for about an hour with no worship leader, no singer on the platform, just the people worshiping, worshiping, singing spontaneous songs together for an hour. And at the end, she stumbled out of the room, and she said, yes, I got them to focus on Jesus. And indeed, that is the, the goal of everything that we do in life and in ministry is just to get people to look at Jesus. You know, I do a lot of ministry in Africa, as those of you that know me and you know my background, we do these massive gospel crusades in Africa, sometimes with hundreds of thousands of people in attendance at one time. And in Africa, you know, titles are very important. How many Africans are here tonight? Any Africans? I'm an African too. I know I look a little bit light-skinned. But if you scratch, you see I bleed African blood. And in Africa, you know, titles are very important. Sometimes you have apostle, prophet, bishop, you know, patriarch, and all these titles, and you have to get each one right. It's very important. They call it protocol. Reinhard Bunke says, I don't believe in protocol. I believe in altar call. <laughs> but the pastors came to me, and they said, they said, what is your title? What do we call you? How do we, how do we introduce you? And, I, and they said, should we call you bishop? Should we call you pastor? Should we call you evangelist? I said, no, I'm an usher. <laughs> and they looked very shocked. They said, an usher? I said, yes. My job is very simple. I usher people to Jesus. And I usher Jesus to people. That's all that we do. 
We actually have a very small job, but it's very, very important. And what a joy it is to work for the Lord. Amen. As I mentioned earlier, um, I've been asked to speak to you about personal revival. And I'm very happy to do that. I need to get started, otherwise there won't be enough time. I know that many of you have already been sitting here for a long time. Maybe your seat is getting tired. Someone told me the mind can only absorb as much as the seat can endure. I hope that all the translators got that. I know it's being translated into many languages right now. And so I'm going to go very quickly, but what I'm going to say is very important, and I believe that it will set the tone for what God will do here through the rest of the week. And so I'm going to read from the book of Psalms chapter 51. If you have your Bibles, please open them with me to the book of Psalms chapter 51. I'm going to read verses 10 through 12. I believe that these verses very accurately describe what personal revival looks like. You know, I, many years ago, I was a part of a revival that was very famous. For three years, I lived there day and night marinating in that atmosphere of revival. And I can tell you that revival to many people looks like an event. They look and they see a church that's filled. They see uh, an excited worship team. They see people who are on fire for God. They see this event. But you see, revival doesn't happen to events. Revival doesn't happen to buildings. Revival doesn't happen to geographical locations. Some people, they're praying that God will send revival to their nation. That's good. They're praying that God will send revival to their city or their church. But if that's your prayer, you're drawing the circle too big. Because God doesn't revive buildings or cities or countries, he revives people. And so somebody said, if you pray for revival, do it like this. Draw a circle on the ground, get inside the circle, and say, God, revive everything inside this circle. And that's our prayer tonight. We're going to ask God to revive us, to revive our hearts because that's how revival happens. Psalms chapter 51, verse 10 through 12. This is a prayer of David, and this is what David prayed. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not from your presence, O God, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Father, I thank you tonight that your Holy Spirit is here. And Lord, I thank you that tonight we work with you to see hearts and lives of men and women touched and changed. Holy Spirit, I ask you to have your way. I ask you to speak to every heart. I ask you to change every life. In the mighty name of Jesus, and everybody said, amen. You know, there's a, an interesting story that I heard about a missionary that went out into the Amazon rainforest. He was sent there to reach a tribe of natives that lived, lived there in the thick jungles of the Amazon. These uh, natives, they had never before had any contact with the outside world. And this missionary who was a medical missionary, he was both a doctor and a preacher, he was going to bring the people healing for their spirits and for their bodies. The problem was that since these natives had never seen an outsider before, they were very suspicious. And so the missionary had to be very careful. He took his time, weeks went by, and he would very carefully make contact with the locals, and he would give them gifts, just little gifts. He would give them candy, and he would give them toys for the children, and, and things that in our world would be very common and probably things we would even throw away. But for them, they had never seen these little things before. And the missionary said that the thing that those locals liked the most was something you probably would not expect. It was these little ladies' compact mirrors. How many of you ladies have a little mirror in your purse that you used to put on makeup with? Be honest, how many of you have it? Or how many of you men have a mirror like, no, just joking. So it's amazing because for you and me, a mirror is something we see every day. We look at our faces every morning, at least I hope so. And we do our hair and we 
brush our teeth and we see how we look before we walk out the door. But these natives had never seen their own reflection before. Think about this. Think about how unusual that is. Yes, maybe in a distorted pool of muddy water down by the river, they would see some kind of distorted reflection of their face, but they never really saw what they looked like. Now, the chief in the village had a daughter who, when she was very young, she had contracted a terrible disease. And as a result of this disease, boils had broken out all over her body. And when these boils would, would heal, when they would dry, they would leave terrible scars all over her skin. And so what had happened is over the years, these many scars had accumulated all over her body and especially on her face. And they had left her hideously deformed. And so this young princess, this chief's daughter, she was actually quite unpleasant to look at. But you know how it is. You don't tell the chief's daughter that she's unpleasant to look at. In fact, what do you say to the chief's daughter? You tell her she's the most beautiful woman in the whole village. Because that's the way it works if you want to live. And so the chief's daughter heard about the missionary that had come, and she heard about the gifts that he was bringing, and she heard that there were these little toys where you could look onto a flat surface and see your own reflection, and she got very excited because she had heard all of her life how beautiful she was, and now she finally had the opportunity to see firsthand how beautiful she really was. So she told one of her servants, go and find a mirror and bring it to me so I can see myself. They found a mirror, they brought it to the palace where the, where the chief's daughter lived, and they gave her the mirror, and she was so excited to look into it, but when she held it up to her face there, she beheld a terrible, terrible truth a terrible reality. She was not a beautiful woman at all, that those scars had left her hideously deformed, that there was something terribly wrong with her. And when she saw that reflection in the mirror, she took that mirror, she threw it on the ground. It shattered into a hundred pieces. She was very angry. She said, take that missionary and throw him out of the village. He is never allowed to return as long as he lives, and there will never be allowed another mirror inside this village. Now, if you look at Psalms chapter 51, I'm going to tell you the second part of that story in a moment because it has an interesting ending. But first, I want to talk here about Psalms 51 because it all ties together. This psalm is a psalm of David. And if you look at your Bible at the beginning of Psalm 51, it will tell you something about where this psalm came from. And this is what it says in my Bible. It says, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone in to Bathsheba. How many of you know that story? Did you realize that this verse we read, create in me a clean heart, O God? Did you realize that that was prayed in the context of the time when Nathan the prophet confronted David after he had gone into Bathsheba. You see, this is what happened. David had grown up a heart-playing, God-loving shepherd boy out in the pastures playing his harp, worshiping the Lord. He had a heart after God. That's what the Bible says. And God loved David's heart so much that God chose him over all the people in the land of Israel. God lifted him up out of that obscure beginning and placed him on the palace of Israel, and he became the leader of the entire Jewish nation. And as the years went by, David's power began to grow. He was a warrior. He was a king. He was a man who could have anything that he wanted just by saying the word. And as the old saying goes, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And as David became more and more powerful, his heart became more and more corrupted. And it happened at such a slow pace that he didn't even notice that it was happening. You see, this is how sin works. Sin often comes into our hearts in such a way that we don't even realize what's happening to us until it's too late. Hearts don't become hardened from one day to the next. They become hardened over time as a person ignores the small warning signs that God has placed within the conscience of men and women. And so over the years, David became more and more hardened until finally his corruption had reached a climax. 
You know the story. He was standing on the roof of the palace looking down, and there he saw a beautiful woman bathing. He lusted for her in his heart. He brought her to the palace. He committed adultery for her, and then he sent her away and thought that no one would ever discover his sin except she became pregnant. And so in order to cover one sin, David had to commit another sin. He had her husband murdered. Adultery, fornication, murder, and still David didn't realize anything was wrong. One day he was sitting in his palace and there was a knock at the door. And when he answered the door, there was Nathan the prophet, an old friend. David said, Nathan, come in, what can I do for you today? And Nathan said, David, I need to tell you a story because something terrible has happened in your kingdom. David said, please tell me. Nathan said, David, there were two men. One was very wealthy and one was very poor. The wealthy man, he had sheep and goats and oxen, cows, everything you can imagine. He he had great, great flocks of animals. But the poor man, he had only one little lamb. He said, this lamb was so precious to him He looked after it and loved it as though it were one of his own daughters. That lamb lived in the house with him. It slept in the bedroom next to his bed at night. He had given it a name. They were close friends. It was a family pet. And one day, David, the rich man, was going to have a party at his house. Many guests were coming over. He had to feed many different people. And so he said to his servants, go to my neighbor's house steal his little lamb, bring it back and murder it, kill it, cook it, and feed it to my guests. And when David heard the story, he began to boil with rage. Righteous indignation began to rise up on the inside of him. You know, it's a lot easier for us many times to see the fault in someone else than it is to see the fault in our own hearts and in our own lives. Isn't that true? That's why Jesus said, take the beam out of your eye before you try to remove the speck out of your brother's eye. David said, Nathan, who is this terrible person? Tell me who they are. I'll take them and I'll string them from the highest tree. And that's when that old prophet stood up. His piercing eyes looked at David. His bony prophet finger pointed in David's face. And he said, David, you are the man. You are the man. And suddenly the scenes from the last weeks played before David's vision. He saw the things he had done. He saw the, what he had done with Bathsheba. He saw what he had done to Uriah, her husband. He saw suddenly himself in, the, in the, the pasture playing his harp. And suddenly he came to grips with what had, become, what had happened. His heart had become miserable and had become sinful. It had become corrupted. And how did David respond to that? The Bible says that he fell on his face. And he began to pray, and he prayed this amazing prayer that I just read for you. And he said, oh God, create in me a clean heart. Cast me not away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with your free spirit. My friend, listen to me. The Bible says that David was a man after God's heart. He wasn't a man after God's heart because he was perfect. He wasn't a man after God's own heart because he did everything right in his life. He was a man after God's heart because when he was confronted with his own internal reality, rather than acting like that chief's daughter, he repented before God and God had mercy on him. And the same thing is going to happen here tonight. God is gonna have mercy on us. In Jesus' name, can you say amen? Amen. You see, what happened that day when Nathan the prophet confronted David is that he brought with him the word of the Lord. How many of you know a prophet speaks the word of the Lord? And this, what I'm holding up here today, is that word of the Lord. It's a mirror for our souls. I I wanna ask my friend there just to bring that mirror. Come on, bring it. Can you bring me the mirror? The Bible tells us in the book of James, thank you, that the word of God is like a mirror for our souls. And when you look in this mirror, you see the reality of the condition of your own heart. When you look into the word of God, you see society tells people that they're okay. Society tells people you don't need to worry. 
That sexual perversion that you deal with, that's just a normal part of human nature. You just need to incorporate it. Don't suppress it, don't deny it. Just express it because it's a part of who you are. And when people look around, they look at other people and they, they say, well, that person doesn't, isn't doing everything perfect and that person isn't doing everything perfect and they compare themselves to one another and they decide, you know what, we're all okay. And we tell each other that, we say, you're all right. And then you tell me, you're all right. And we all feel like nothing's wrong. But then something happens like it's happening right now. A prophet comes and he brings the word of the Lord and he holds up a mirror. You see, this book is, is God's mirror. And this is what this mirror says. It says, the heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked, so much so that no one can understand it. This mirror says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This mirror says that there is no, no one righteous. No, not even one. It says that all we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own path, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. You know, when I read that verse for many, many years, when I read, Create in me a clean heart, O God, I always read it the wrong way. I read it like this. I thought David was saying, God, clean my heart. Give my heart an extreme makeover. Fix me up. And then one day when I was reading it, I realized that that's not the way the scripture is written at all. David didn't say, God, give my heart a, a, a deep cleaning. He said, God, create in me a clean heart. He used the word create. You know, to create something means to make something from nothing. And did you know that only God can create something from nothing? Did you know that? No, you, maybe, maybe you're an artist, maybe you're a musician, and you say, no, I can create. I can create a beautiful sculpture. I can create a beautiful painting. But you see, you didn't actually create anything. You just rearranged materials that were already there to begin with. It's only God that has the ability to create something from nothing. Only God can create light out of darkness. Only God can create righteousness out of sinfulness. Only God can create freedom out of bondage. Only God can change your heart and give you a new heart tonight. This is why all the things that the world has tried to fix the human condition have never worked. Because all people can do is rearrange the same mess, the same garbage. They just put it in a different order. They try a new political system. They turn to a new political party. Some of you have put so much faith in the government of whatever country you come from. If you're Americans, maybe your faith is in the Republicans, or maybe your faith is in the Democrats, or maybe your faith is in the independents. All of them just mix the same garbage up and give it back to you in a new form. That's not the solution. Governments can't fix the world. Religion can't fix the world. The military can't fix the world. Only the blood of Jesus has the ability to create a brand new heart inside of people. I, I come from Florida in the United States. And Florida is famous for many things. One of the less popular things Florida is famous for is hurricanes. Hurricanes come just about every year through different cities and they devastate different cities. And several years ago, a hurricane passed through my hometown. Now I lived in a different city at the time, but when I went back the next day to help my family clean up the mess, it was amazing because places where I had known since childhood, familiar places that I, I knew by heart, they were so devastated and so destroyed that I was lost in my own hometown. And I remember as we were driving down the road, I was looking at the different houses and I noticed that once in a while I would see a house that had a red X spray painted on the front door. And I saw this again and again and again and it made me curious. And so I said to one of my friends, what is going on with the red X? What does that mean? And my friend said, you see, the red X means that the county authorities, the city authorities, they have come and they have inspected the structure. And they have seen that it has endured so much damage that it is not fixable. It has to be completely demolished and a new house has to be built in its place. You can't just fix the roof, you can't just paint the walls, you can't just bring in new plaster or new plywood. You have to tear it down 
and build something totally new in its place. Listen to what Charles Spurgeon said. Human nature is too far gone to ever be mended. It is not a house that is a little bit out of repair with here and there a slate blown down from the roof and here and there a piece of plaster broken down from the ceiling. No, it is rotten throughout. The very foundations have been sapped. There is not a single piece of wood in it which has not been eaten by worms. From its uppermost roof to its lowest foundation, there is no soundness in it. It is all rottenness. It is all ready to fall. And God does not attempt to mend it. He does not shore up the walls and repaint the door. He does not garnish and beautify, but he determines that the old house will be entirely swept away and he will build a new one in its place. That is the gospel. Jesus said, I will take away, in Ezekiel, the Old Testament, it says, I will take away their heart of stone and I will give to them a heart of flesh. This is what God wants to do for you today. My time is gone, let me finish my story. It's interesting because when the chief's daughter saw her reflection in that mirror, she became angry. She threw it on the ground, it shattered. She made the missionary leave the town. She banished all mirrors from ever coming back into the village. But I told you that the missionary that came into the village was actually a medical missionary. He had a bag of medicine. And this is what the chief's daughter didn't know, that in that bag, the missionary had a medicine that was the very cure for the disease that had so disfigured her. And when she threw him out of the village, with the village, she threw away her only hope for ever being healed. Now, here's the reality, my friend. When you look into the mirror of God's word, when you see what the scriptures say, when you see yourself the way that God sees you, you have to make a choice at that moment. You can respond like the chief's daughter. You can say, get out of my face, you stupid preacher. Take your Bible and your religion and your legalism and your stupidity and your superstition and get out of my face. I don't want to hear from you anymore. You can do that, but if you do that with me, and with this word, you will also throw away the only hope for the very disease that so disfigures your soul. Or you can respond like David did. You can fall on your face and you can say, God, create a clean heart within me. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your salvation. Uphold me with the free spirit. See, that is where personal revival happens. Everybody stand with me tonight. Tomorrow, Heidi's gonna be ministering to you, and, and Yopst is gonna be ministering in many other amazing sessions, and I believe with all of my heart that God has things he wants to give you this week. He wants to speak to you. He wants to impart things into your life. Some of you have no idea the destiny that God has waiting for you. But some of you have disqualified yourself because when God looks for a vessel to use, he looks for a vessel that's clean. There's some of you listening to me right now. You came all the way to Israel, came all the way to Jerusalem. And you know that there's a problem. And even when I'm preaching now, you, you begin to feel something happening on the inside. I discovered a long time ago that, that when we preach the gospel, the Holy Spirit begins to work. Many times people would come up to me and they would say, you know, preacher, when you said this and this and this, it really touched me and it was exactly what I needed. And I would just nod and I'd say, amen, amen, bless, praise the Lord. And then when they left, I would think to myself, I never said any of those things. And it happened so many times I began to wonder what was going on and then one day I realized what it was. You see, between me and you, there's an interpreter. And yes, maybe someone's interpreting into your native tongue, but that's not the interpreter I'm talking about. The interpreter is the Holy Spirit. 
and he takes what I'm saying and he customizes it for you. And many of you have felt, even as I've been talking, your own heart being stirred. You felt your, yourself, that uncleanness on the inside. You've, you've become aware of it as though the mirror of Nathan's mirror, the word of God has just been held up before you and you've seen your reflection and you're saying, God, I don't want this anymore. I don't want to live like this anymore. I can't go one more day like this. Lord, create in me a clean heart. And if that's your prayer, tonight is your night. You don't have to live like that anymore. You don't have to carry that guilt and that shame around anymore. You can put it under the blood of Jesus today. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. He will take away that heart of stone. He will give you a heart of flesh. In fact, this is what I believe is going to happen tonight. Open heart surgery. Open heart surgery is what's about to happen. He's going to take away the old heart and he's going to give you a new one. You're going to begin to love things you used to hate. You're going to begin to hate things you used to love. You won't even recognize yourself anymore. Some of you are so frustrated and so tired because you've been trying for so long to force yourself to behave differently without having an internal change of heart. Jesus didn't come to make bad men good. He came to make dead men live. What you need is not just an extreme makeover. You need a new heart. You don't need to try to force a change to happen from the outside in. You need your heart to change so that your life is transformed from the inside out. That's what we need tonight. I'm asking every person in this place to bow their head and close their eyes. And I'm asking you that if the Holy Spirit has spoken to you and you would say, Daniel, I need a heart transplant tonight. I need a new heart. I need Jesus to come and give me his own heart. I want you to lift your hand so I can pray with you tonight. I'm not here to embarrass you or shame you. I want to pray with you. Thank you, Jesus. This is wonderful. This is what this is all about. This is where revival begins. I cannot call you forward because there's too many hands, but those of you that have your hands lifted, we're going to pray a prayer together. And I'm telling you, Jesus will hear this prayer and a miracle will happen right now. A creative miracle. He's going to give you a new heart. I want everybody to pray this prayer with me in support of those that have their hands raised and do not whisper it. Pray with all of your heart. Say, dear Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, say it again. Dear Lord Jesus Christ. I come to you tonight, a sinner needing salvation. Lord Jesus, I cannot save myself, but I throw myself on your mercy. And I say, create in me a clean heart, oh God. Create in me. A clean heart, oh God. Make me a new creation. Change my heart and change my life. Transform me into your image. In the name of Jesus, I put my trust in you. I put my faith in you. And as of this night, I belong to Jesus. And Jesus belongs to me. I believe it. I receive it. And I confess it. In the name of Jesus. And everybody said, hallelujah, hallelujah, amen. We're not done. We're not done yet. Because you see, I'm a Holy Ghost man. And I'll never apologize for it. I've been told that I could have bigger crusades and a bigger ministry if I would stop talking about the Holy Ghost. But I tell you what, I put my money, all my money on the Holy Ghost. That's the horse that I'm betting on. And I won't apologize for it. See, this is what Jesus said. He told a parable. He said, if a, if a man is cleansed of an unclean spirit, The spirit will wander around in dry places, and then when he comes back and finds that same place still empty and swept and clean, he goes and finds seven more spirits, even more filthy than himself, and they come back, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. And this is what, this is the way that I read that. You don't just need to clean the cup. You need to fill it up with something good. You need to fill it up. And Jesus said, 
when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power. And you'll be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the world. You see, the Holy Spirit has not just been given to give us goosebumps in Pentecostal church services. He's given to fill us with the very power of the living God that raised Christ from the dead. That same Holy Spirit needs to fill you tonight, and that's exactly what's going to happen. And so we're going to do that right now. How many of you need to receive the infilling of the Holy Ghost? Let me see your hands. Okay. Okay, put your hands down. Let me, let me do something first. How many of you have already received the baptism into the Holy Spirit? How many of you have received? And you know, you know it. It's not like maybe, I think so one time, I repeated Shadabanda Honda after some evangelist. No, you know you got it. Re wave at me. Okay. I'm, I've just recruited all of you, and I'm deputizing you right now. You are now Holy Ghost evangelists. Okay, you ready? Now, those of you that need to receive, I want you to lift your hands. Those of you that need to receive the baptism the, to the Holy Spirit, lift your hands. Come on, don't be shy. There were a bunch of you before, now you're all so shy. Lift those hands, wave, well, I want to see where you are. Now those around them, the ones that have their hands raised, gather around them and put your hands on them. And I want you to begin to pray for them right now and release the power of the Holy Ghost. When somebody comes over to you and puts their hand on you, you can put your hand down. But until then, keep your hand up. Come on, I have someone over here. I have some up here on the balcony. Everybody who has their hands up needs someone around them praying for them. Release that power of the Holy Ghost into their life right now. Come on, be filled with the Holy Ghost in the mighty name of Jesus. Out of your innermost being will flow rivers, 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 rivers in Jesus' name. Be loosed in the name of Jesus. Be loosed in the name of Jesus. Every barrier be removed. Every tie be broken. Be filled with the Holy Ghost right now in the name of Jesus. Be filled in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you that their tongues are being loosed right now. Just begin to open your mouth and begin to speak in tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. Receive in Jesus' name. Rivers, 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 rivers. So rebasho.